We are starting chapter two for algebra two. Our topic today is relations and functions, being able to tell the difference between them. We're going to look at different ways to represent them, including graphing them. And we're looking at how we can tell if a relation is actually a function or not. Okay. So we define a relation to be a set of pairs of inputs and output values. In other words, we're just pairing up two numbers. And there's four different ways that we can represent that. We can just show them as ordered pairs. All right, we're pairing them up in a certain order, typically x and y. We can show them as a mapping diagram. Now, in a mapping diagram, we have the same information we had here as an ordered pair, but we've condensed it down. So notice on this one that the 4 is being paired up with a negative 1 and a 3. We can show that on our mapping diagram with our arrows. So we don't have to write the 4 twice. We just put it in there once, and we just draw arrows to any numbers it's paired with. Okay. Our third method is just to make a table of values. Most of the time when you're asked to graph something, you use this, right? You set up a table of values and then you graph them. Our last option is to show them as a graph. So in our first example, we are given information about a skydiver, and we are told how high the skydiver is at, at different times. Okay? So how high he was when he first jumped out of the plane, after four seconds, after eight seconds, etc. So we're going to pair those data up. What would make sense to use as our x's? The time? And then the y's would be the height. Okay. So as time goes on, the height decreases, right? They're going, getting closer and closer to Earth. Okay. So I'm going to pause the video. What you are to do for example one is show that data in all four of these methods. Okay. All right. To check your example one. So again, Typically, you wouldn't be asked to do all four different methods in one question, but we're just trying to condense it down and say, how would you represent this in all four ways? We have the table of values. We have our ordered pairs. In this case, in our, case, our mapping diagram, every time is just paired up with one height, right? So you just have arrows straight across. And then our graph. Without having a grid to graph it on, it might not be as obvious, but your points are not in a line. They are curving down, kind of like part of an upside down parabola look. Okay? All right. Have you heard the terms domain and range? Okay, what do we mean when we say the domain? You've heard the terms, but you can't define them? Okay. Domain for a relation is all of the inputs or x's. Okay? So your domain is your x-coordinates, and your range would be your y-coordinates. All right? Domain is x, range is y. If it helps you to remember, think alphabetical. Okay? If we're looking at the start of these two words, d comes before r in the alphabet, and x comes before y in the alphabet. Okay? So domain first, range second. We're going to look at different ways to list or show the domain and range of a relation. One is just to write them out as a set of numbers. Okay. If we go with those same values that we had for the skydiving example, our domain, we said, are the x values, which in that case were all the times. So what times did we have? All right. So we're going to say the set of all of those numbers. OK. 
okay? Our range would be all of the Y values. What did we, we started out at 10,000 feet, then we were at 9,744. What was next? 8,976. Okay. Next. Say it again. Seven. Okay. And then what was it? 5904. Okay. So again, if we just have a finite set of numbers, we can show them like that. Just list them out. Okay. But not all relations are going to be like that. So for a continuous graph, meaning the graph doesn't end, it's not just a set of five points, it's a whole big continuous graph, we're going to have to use inequalities to show our domain and range. A couple hints for you. Look for whether there is a minimum or maximum number for either x or y then write the inequality in the appropriate direction. In other words, if there's a minimum, then we just start getting bigger from there. If there's a maximum, we have to be underneath that, less than that. The other hint, if x or y can be anything, meaning the graph does not stop, then we say the domain is all real numbers. Okay, now, one type of notation for all real numbers is to make a capital R but the font that is typically used has kind of a double bar for that left bar. So this is not I and then R. It's just an R with a double bar here. Okay? That's the symbol for all real numbers. Okay? If we were putting it in interval notation, we would say we want everything from negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, we're saying everything works. Make sure you're writing both of those down, all right, depending on which type I'm asking for in, in any one particular question. So I'm giving you a few graphs here. We're going to analyze. Is it possible just to make a list of a few numbers, or do we have a whole big interval of numbers that work? Okay, so our first one. Anybody know what shape this is? What kind of graph it comes from? It is a V. What kind of graph gives you a V? Absolute value, yes. This is an absolute value graph. It continues on. Now, you have to analyze both X and Y. So if we look at our X's, it's obvious that for X's close to the origin here, there's a point, right? For each of these x's, there's a point associated with the y value, okay? If I go out further, there is a point. It's just off the graph that I tried to show you, right? But it's, there's still a point up there that would work because those lines continue going upward. So for my x's, there is no limit. I can go out here further. It's just my points get further and further up. I can do the same thing on the left side. So my domain would be that x could equal all real numbers. But again, in our interval notation, we would write that. Now, for our y's, there's not a, a finite set of numbers we can write down, but there is a cutoff. If we look in our y direction, there is a cutoff right here. There's no part of my graph that's below that line. So what I want to say for my y's is that the lowest they can be is negative 4, and then they can go up from there. Okay. Now again, in interval notation, we're saying we're going to start at negative 4, and we're going to keep going up towards positive infinity. For our second picture, we have an ellipse. It's kind of that oval shape. Okay. 
In this case, we are cutting it off in both X and Y directions, right? There's a border that I don't go past. What is the lowest X value that I use? X's. From negative 6 to positive 6. So in our old notation, we would write it like that. In our new notation, our interval notation, we're going to say we want the interval of numbers between negative 6 and positive 6, including them. All right. What can you tell me about the y values? They are between what? OK, so I heard 2 and negative 2. We always start with the smaller number and go to the bigger. So we're going from negative 2 up to positive 2. OK, and in our interval notation, we'd list it that way. All right, last one. Is there any limit in the x direction? Any limit in the y direction? So x and y could both be all real numbers. Or in interval notation, we're including from negative infinity to positive infinity. Make sure that you've written both of those methods down, the old notation in blue and the interval notation in red. All right. So we've been talking about relations, just a pairing up of numbers. What we're going to look at now is what kind of relations actually are functions. So a function is a specific kind of relation. It's a relation in which every x is paired with a single y value. Every element of the domain has to correspond with exactly one element from the range. Okay, so each x is paired with a single y value. There cannot be any duplicates. I can't have an x going to two different y values. It's still a relation, but it's not a function. We're going to be using functions a lot this year. Okay? So I've given you a couple different ways of showing a relation. I want to determine if it's a function. So looking at this first one, the 2 is paired with a 1. So a 2 goes to a single value in the y column. The 4 goes to a single value in the y column. It happens to be the same value that the, the 3 went to, or the 2 went to, but it's still an x going to a single y. Here we have an x going to a single y. This would be a function. Okay, Every x is paired with a single y. For this one, is every x going to a single y value. OK? Our shortened way of writing function is just fn. OK, so yes, that's a function. How about this one? We don't have any numbers to look at, but if you had an x going to two different y's, what would it look like on a graph? If you had one x going to two different y's. Yeah, they'd line up vertically, right? And right here, we have two dots that are lining up vertically. That means when x is negative 3, it's paired up with a 2 and a negative 1. All right, that's not a function. OK, our last one is just listing ordered pairs. 4 is paired with negative 1. 8 is paired with 6, 1 is paired with negative 1, 6 is paired with 6, 4 is paired with 1. Is it a function? Why not? OK, students get this mixed up a lot. I heard people saying the negative 1s and the 6s. That doesn't matter. You are looking for a single x that has two different y-coordinates attached to it. 
here, 4 is paired with negative 1 and 4 is paired with positive 1. That can't happen for it to be a function. Those two points would line up vertically. Okay? Just because there's two y values of negative 1 and there's two y values of 6, that doesn't affect it. You're looking at the x's. How are the x's paired? Okay? So if an x is repeated, then it's not a function. All right. I'm going to pause the video for a second. Write down an example of a function. You can do it as an ordered pair, a graph, a mapping diagram, a table of values, but show me one that's a function. All right, so I saw a lot of table of values, mapping diagrams, um, some graphs, as long as your points don't line up vertically, that's fine. All right, we have a test that we can use on graphs to determine if they're a function. Because when you have a graph, you don't see all the data, so it's harder to say, are my x's repeating? Okay? But there's a way we have called the vertical line test. Basically, it says, if a vertical line passes through more than one point, the relation is not a function. If a vertical line passes through more than one point, then it's not a function. We call this the vertical line test. Now, why does it work? If I have two x's that are paired up with the same, or with the same x paired up with two different y's, sorry. If I have the same x paired up with two different y's, they line up vertically. So when I do the vertical line test, if I can drop a line anywhere in my graph, drop a vertical line and it hits more than one spot, it's not a function. Okay? So the reason it works, the same x paired with two y's would line up vertically. Okay? That's what we don't want to happen. So for these pictures, picture dropping a vertical line through them. Would your vertical line hit in more than one spot on the first one? Yes. The axis here is a good example, right? That y-axis is hitting the graph in two spots. That means the same x would be lined up with two, would be paired up with two different y's. So this is not a function. And our reason is it fails the vertical line test, VLT, fails vertical line test. How about the second picture? Are any of those points lining up vertically? Okay, so yes, it's a function. And our reason it passes vertical line test. How about the last one? Same thing? Okay. The last little bit that we're going to talk about is our notation when we have a function. If we know something is a function, our rule is going to set, be set up as an equation that represents the output value in terms of the input. Now, what does that mean? We said our x's are typically our input values, right? What we dump in, and y is what we get out. OK. The input values are your independent variable. OK? What would be your inputs would represent the independent variable. I remember that because they both start out with in. OK? Input, independent variable. Your output is your dependent variable. Now, what we mean by that is I can input anything I want, right? If I'm given an equation, I can plug in num different numbers for x. I can choose that. It's independent. But the answer I get out 
is dependent on what I dumped in. Okay? So my answer depends on what I plug in. So that y value is our dependent one. The notation we use when something's a function is this f of x. Okay? That doesn't mean f times x. The parentheses here are not used for multiplication purposes. We are saying f of x. In other words, we have a function that is going to use x as its independent variable. Okay? So instead of writing y equals 3x plus 2, we're going to say f of x equals 3x plus 2. So our first question, f of x, so we're telling you it's a function, equals negative 2x plus 5. Evaluate it for the out, um, find the outputs for the inputs of negative 3, 0, and 1 fourth. So we're looking for what is f of negative 3? What is f of 0? And what is f of 1 fourth? We're being given three different x's and asked to dump them in. So we dump them in here. I put a negative 3 in for x. What do I get on the right-hand side? What do we get? Come on, guys. We get 11. So we're just going to say f of negative 3 equals 11. Yes? That's just the same as saying if I put negative 3 in for x, I get 11 for y. I'm being given an ordered pair. Okay. Over here, f of 0. If I put a 0 in, I get what? So f of 0 is 5. f of 1 fourth. What's negative 2 times 1 fourth? So negative 1 half plus the 5. What do we have? All right, so 4 and a half, 4.5. Okay, so it's not new things. It just looks different. The notation is a little different. But you're used to being given a table of values and plugging those x's in, right? Okay. We are short on time, so we're going to skip this next one and go to the last question here. When trying to write a function rule for a real-world problem, determine which variable is independent and which one is dependent. All right? We have to decide what is it that's representing our x's and what is representing our y's. In this example, we're told the cost of a pizza is $14, and then there's a flat delivery fee of $1.50. Write a function model. Write a function rule to model the total cost. The One All right. So we have a pizza cost being $14 with a flat delivery fee of $1.50. It says, what function rule models the total cost based on the number of pizzas delivered? So cost depends on how many pizzas we order. So cost is our dependent variable, or our y in our equation. And the number of pizzas will be the independent variable, or our x's. Now, for function notation, instead of saying f of x, a lot of times they will change that variable, that f, to represent the type of, of um, number they're looking for. So since it's cost, we could say c of x. Right? The cost of our pizzas, based on x pizzas, we have $14 for every pizza we buy. And then there's a flat $1.50 delivery fee. Our last piece here says to evaluate for five pizzas. So our cost for five pizzas is what we get when we dump a five in for our x. So 14 times five is 70 plus $1.50. We'd be paying $71.50 for five 
for those five pizzas. All right, so we are looking at section 2.1, and there is your homework assignment.